Emblems of Enlightenment. Hey there. Today I'm going to talk about a fascinating subject. A practice which was very popular during the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, but is not really very well known today. I'm talking about the contemplation of symbolic pictures or paintings. Nowadays, we would probably associate this with Eastern traditions like yoga or Buddhism. And indeed, if you are educated in this area, you will find this a really insightful and inspirational talk because you're about to gain a fresh perspective from a completely different traditional current. You'll find that many things match up. Indeed, what you know of the mandala, you most certainly should apply to the emblem. But be aware that there are new and varied insights and slightly different understandings. Indeed, the very feel of this practice has its own specific resonance and direction. So let's start our exploration into emblems. And before you, you can see the first example of an emblem which we ourselves are going to meditate upon. This woodcut has been beautifully coloured in and it depicts some very well-dressed gentlemen sitting around a table. They're contemplating a symbolic painting that's upon it. Yes, you are correct. Our first emblem is of practitioners meditating upon an emblem. The gentlemen are in fact Freemasons. Now, this is a tradition that has kept the emblematic tradition going even into the modern day. And the painting they're looking at would modernly be called a tracing board. Above them, there is the Eye of Provenance with a light shining from it, a beam of light hitting the mirror here. Shining from the mirror, we can see the reflected light, which shines in a pyramid shape upon the picture that they're looking at. Within the beam of light, there's a Latin phrase, the light shined in the darkness. And coming from the mirror, the second half of this biblical quote, and the darkness comprehended it not. This picture is a very good example of an emblem. It's got many different symbols and different ways to consider it. And it's got a, a sentence or a motto to the whole thing, a key to help you really explore the lessons and mysteries it contains. A traditional practitioner from the day would take this picture and they'd really go in depth. They would aim to go through various different stages to explore everything. They would memorize what they could see. They would muse upon every aspect. They would be thinking in terms of that biblical quote, in terms of the mirror, how the, the checkerboard floor that the gentleman is sitting on reflects the checkerboard floor in the tracing board they're looking at. They would have a lot of classical and biblical knowledge to really be able to find layers of meaning. Of course, the really important lessons are there for all of us to see. It's obvious for us looking at the picture that the gentleman closest to us is guiding the rest. He's obviously reciting something. He's memorized all the different Masonic symbols. And likewise, we can see that the theme is reflection. And like the, the mirror, the symbols and the pictures are going to allow these practitioners to explore and know themselves. But there's also a suggestion of illumination from above, uh, enlightenment being filled with a, a higher light. These are all aspects of this practice that we're going to, to visit in depth as we continue through our journey. 
So let's start with the practice of memory. And to help us with this, we're going to consult a great authority, which would be well known at the time. I'm talking about St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas Aquinas was well trained in the Christian memory practices. And it's important for everyone listening to this uh, to understand that at the time, everyone believed that what you remembered became you. What you put into your consciousness becomes part of your consciousness. This was understood on a very basic level by most people. They knew that big experiences could change you dramatically, but they also knew that you became a bit more like whatever you focused on. Within Christian communities, there were very simple ways of using this. Memory was viewed kind of in the same way we would view hypnosis or creative visualisation. Memory was when you, you painted something in your mind and it could be using it to recall things, but it could be used just as a, a way of creating something, an image or a understanding within your consciousness. So if you're having problems of anxiety, you would be taught how to imagine different scenes from a stained glass window which were calming and reassuring. Or if you had a problem um, with a another personality trait, uh, you would probably be taught a, a prayer or a poem to memorise. Uh, maybe if you were an angry person, you'd learn a, a, a tale which would inspire self-control or temperateness. Within the, the more learned specialist clergy and members of the, uh, the church, this was explored in a far more in-depth way. Thomas Aquinas had read Aristotle and he knew uh, that he, that the mind worked by images and associations. He'd learnt a lot from his teacher, St Albert the Great, and he had a very clear understanding of how memorization of a symbol could be a tool for the evolution and improvement of the self. This quote, which I've got for those who are interested, is him telling us why this is so. Uh, basically, Thomas Aquinas knew that your mind liked to learn from experiences, from images, from sense impressions. It's very easy if you just decide you want to do something or someone asks you to do something or you take just a verbal vow just to forget about it. But if you make an image in your mind, if you hook it on uh, a statue of uh, someone who's a, a great uh, example of this or a story about someone or a symbol, it allows you to hold on to that intention. It's like your mind listens more. It's as if you've experienced it. So the difference would be uh, the difference between you learning uh, from slipping on the ice to how much you learn from the sign saying careful slippy ice. The big experience, whether it's a very good one or a very uncomfortable one, is something that allows you to learn. And we can imitate this by using a memorization of a symbol and uh, learning uh, through contemplation on a symbolic image. His teacher, I mentioned uh, before, um, went even further. So he used the example of a, a wolf. If you get bitten by a wolf, uh, then you don't need to do any more learning. You are going to be uh, fearful of it from, from then on. So Albert the Great, St Thomas Aquinas' teacher, he stated that this is because it went into your estimative power or your estimative ability. This is the term used for your animal mind or your subconscious. Uh, so it goes straight in there. 
you can take advantage of this if you meditate on the symbol of an angel, if you really contemplate that angel and put that image with all the beautiful associations, what the angel wears, what it, uh, it means, what the, maybe a poem to do with the angel and the symbolic aspects of her wings and what she um, is holding and what she's done. You could put this into the same kind of part of your mind. It goes into your animal mind or your subconscious, into your estimative ability or estimative power. You've upgraded your mind. You've cultivated virtue in a quick uh, way. Practitioners of um, meditation will understand this immediately, how the idea of meditating on something can lead to a connection with it. And they're saying that this is through your memory. The memory is when you store something in your mind, you can store a lesson if it's got a strong image or set of images with it. Now, it's worth noting that this isn't a very new concept. It, it wasn't specifically a, a Christian one. It, the first mention we ever see of this overtly is actually part of the, the Greek tradition, um, a very ancient text from 422 years BC called Disoi Logai, which teaches about the power of memory, how you should put memory images into a, a kind of memory palace or a convenient, well-spaced apart list. How if you want to remember something, it needs to have an image in your mind, which is dramatic and easy to recall from being emotional or colourful. Um, this text actually makes clear that you can use this to improve your character. And it gives some hints and examples. So if you want to, if you want to cultivate a, a sense of um, valour, uh, then you are going to, uh, or heroism, you're going to memorise all things about Achilles. You're going to put an image of Achilles in your mind and you're going to memorise all the, the things he did. You're going to do this and this will make you more heroic. If you want to be a more uh, brave or ferocious, you can imagine yourself as a, a lion and put that into your memory. And so this is a, a beginning of a practice of the art of memory, but not just for remembering things, but for transforming your mind. But there's more. Do you remember I talked about that, that stage uh, beyond this, where you start to contemplate? So you've memorized, you put this into your mind, now you're going to start to, to contemplate. Well, there's an idea uh, that... If you really do this properly, it can lead to something beyond uh, just a memory. It can lead to a, a genuine connection, a connection through oneness. They called this contraction. So before you is a picture of two hearts, two hearts, and there's a beautiful light shining. And this beautiful light shines on both hearts, but only one shines back. Uh, this is probably inspired by a, a quote uh, by uh, Plotinus in his Inneads. And this is uh, from Massilio Fatino's translation. And uh, I'm doing this from memory. Uh, so it says that when a soul shines with uh, a light towards something which is above it, then there is a contraction that brings them both together. Uh, sometimes that's trans translated as a mind shines. Uh, but the, the idea is that you can, can, through the law of sympathy, tune into things. So every day, you, the people you meet, the objects you see, there's an opportunity to be in resonance. There was a belief at the time that the stars shone down their energy and some stones would reflect it, some plants would be in tune of it, some animals... Everything was about resonance of being in tune and your meditation, your meditatio could allow you to tune in to your mind, for your memory. When you're putting in memories to do with things, you are creating a resonance. If you did this properly, if you were pure, if you were, had no conflicts, if you could be in a state of oneness, you could achieve contraction upon that thing. This is the idea of the illumination from above. This light could fill you. You could become at one with an original uh, concept like love or like truth. Uh, this would uh, be the, the ultimate in your contemplation practice. This would be your extatio, your oneness. And yes, for those who, um, who are from Eastern traditions, this is Psalmody. Uh, 
Uh, so Psalmody to the Renaissance practitioner is when you are so in tune with a higher power that the light shines through you and you become enlightened. That's where the, the sort of term comes from. So to understand contraction, we've got two wonderful practitioners before us. We've got Robert Flood and we've got Giordano Bruno. As you can see, uh, both of them were alive at the, the same time, but they've got very different characters. So if we read Giordano Bruno and we memorize his principles of uh, shadows, it becomes clear that for him, contraction in its pure form, he lists many forms of contraction, but in its pure form, the way he wants to do it, uh, he's, uh, he's going to do this through pure awareness and focus. The images are not going to waver or fade. They're going to be so constant in the mind that they become uh, connected with the original. He's going to make them brighter and clearer. He's like a Zen master. It's pure focus and control. And that's how the oneness is achieved. If you do this, then yes, there'll be other aspects of you all open up. It will be oneness on all levels, but the key is through this uh, unwavering focus. Uh, you can you could imagine this very much like a, uh, a yogic practitioner who has studied their uh, Patanjali uh, well. If we were uh, to read Robert Flood, it's very different. It's all heart based. You've got to open your heart to the people who are right, to the things that are right, and to the higher forces. Sit under that star. Really tune into it. The head will follow. Get the heart right. You can see this almost like a, someone who's uh, a bhakti yogi, who's uh, maybe they've studied the Bhagavad Gita, uh, but this is all heart based. But they're both described contraction. This pure state of oneness can lead to the new found abilities, insights and uh, powers from this. And this is just the same as you see in the Eastern traditions as well. Uh, so maybe if we can have uh, Bruno and Flood as our guides and give the head and heart equal importance, then we can have that uh, that sort of best of both worlds. Now, of course, this concept isn't a, a new one. People have understood that you can achieve oneness through meditation from ancient times. Here are a few quotes from the Neoplatonic tradition. There's Iamblichus, who's, who's talking about the Egyptian tradition. And then below him, that's that quote, quote by Plotinus. You can see whether I got it right or not. And I just put this here to show you through Pseudo Dionysus that this came into the Christian tradition very much uh, from the Neoplatonic tradition. This really inspired uh, them. Now that we understand the methods of practice and the principles behind them, let's explore where the emblems themselves came from. To do this, we need to go back to medieval times. And we're going to take a visit to a, a castle or a monastery because we're looking for someone who's got quite a bit of money and a good education for books are very expensive in those days and literacy is rare. If we did find the right person and explored their library, we might find a tome of great interest, a bestiary. A bestiary is a book of animals which contains all the lessons you need to know about exotic beasts from around the world. The aim is to learn a lesson from each animal. And this was inspired by various quotes from the Bible that talk about how nature can be our teacher. In these tales, fact, fiction and rumour all combine. And likewise, you can most certainly see that there's been some effort to make these images and tales memorable. So looking at the animals before you, you can see a rather spotty 
looking cat creature sitting with his mouth wide open. You will immediately, of course, recognise him as a panther because panthers are all the colours of the rainbow. And he has his mouth open because, as you are probably aware, panthers give off a beautiful scent which all animals like, apart from the dragon. Next to him, you can see a man with a sling. He's about to hit the cinema log bird. That cinnamon bird is is protecting the cinnamon in the tree. It's the only bird that can actually gather the cinnamon. Uh, so that's why that you have to knock them off their perch to be able to bring uh, that back. Next, you can see the bonicon. Uh, the bonicon is a a kind of bull-like creature, and he's very passive and tame and not very brave. But he can, of course, uh, defend himself. He can uh, fire from his rear end, flaming dung that can fly up to to two miles, and and this is his defence that he uses against people who, who attack him. Next, we go back down the bottom. You can see uh, another sort of stag or bull-like creature there. He's got one horn forwards and one horn back. He's a yale. He's able to rotate his his horns independently, and he can even do things like he can he can fence with you. He can use one for defence and one for attack, like a good fencer. He can also jump off cliffs and land. His his horns are so strong he can land straight on his horns uh, to to shield himself. Next, you can see the salamander coming from the flames. He's so cool, the salamander, that no flames hurt him. The bear there, you probably heard the term licking into shape. Well, this comes from bears. Uh, bears, when they give birth to their children, they don't have any shape. The bear actually has to carve or uh, lick his babies into shape. That's the first thing the mother bear does. Uh, so uh, that's what she's doing here. And then we've got the, the adder here. Adders, as you know, put their, uh, their tails into their ears to stop hearing the drumming or the mu musician playing. Uh, a mu uh, the, sometimes it's a, a pipe, uh, so that would attract it. So it, 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 it cuts his ears off. So all these fantastic stories, which I'm sure you'll agree you will remember now, have a symbolic meaning. So... The um, the Panthers like the words of Jesus, uh, that the kindness of Jesus that shines out. And if you're kind, those who reject you are only the dragons. If we look at the salamander, he's so uh, ascetic and detached. He's so cool to the world and nothing can hurt him. So this is the kind of lessons that would be associated with each one of these animals. Now, we know that these were used for contemplation and they were memorised. They were even used for lists. We know that people would use them to memorise who was coming to a, uh, their, a gathering. It's very easy, isn't it? If, you, if you've got a list of animals in your head, you could just imagine each one of your guests riding on that animal uh, to, to remember them in order. So they were used as memory palaces, but they also would give you lessons. Now, it's just as a side here, Hermetic practitioners later on in the Renaissance revisited this. You can see Bruno using it in his uh, cantations of uh, Circe and using it almost as a kind of banishing of negative qualities and of negative people. But they also use them as empowerments, almost shamanic empowerments later on. You can become at one with the animal and you've got their qualities. This, of course, is is also in Eastern tradition, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali state clearly that you could gain the strength of an elephant by meditating on an elephant. So as time went on, these bestiaries circulated around Europe. They became increasingly uh, complex and interesting and varied, and they started to evolve. It took quite a while for these to become emblems, uh, but emblems they became, and they were imported uh, during Tudor times back to to England in their new form. So let's have a look at a actual emblem book. Here's one from the early 1600s and you can immediately see in this random selection the hints of its origin 
the antecedent uh, being the bestiary. Good fortune will with him abide that have to virtue for his guide, so tells us the griffin. Or no passage can divert the course of the pegasus, the muse horse. So these would be symbols in a book or, or sometimes in a pack of cards. Uh, you also see those that a, a gentleman or a lady would contemplate in their spare time for their own betterment. You can see other symbols appearing uh, like the the heart, which is full of heavenly knowledge or the uh, consistent compasses here which are not animal related, but still have the same format and the same kind of message. By memorizing these and putting them uh, within your consciousness, you would plant a seed that would bring around a change. Now, talking of hearts and seeds, let me show you this Rosicrucian emblem book by Daniel Kramer, from Germany. As you can see, it's got the same kind of format, but the theme is overtly esoteric. Your heart is going to go on a journey of transformation through 40 different emblems. You can just imagine how Robert Flood would have approved. The aim of this text and texts like it is of course far more ambitious. We're not just aiming to be more virtuous, positive people. We're going to be led to a regeneration of the self, to a, a higher state of consciousness. It's worth noting that there were many popular sets of cards with similar style heart-based themes, which would be carried next to your heart and through daily contemplation, through memorization and through illumination, you would open your heart and go through a transformation, a transformation that actually was believed to be so powerful that there would be observable physical changes from this. Texts from this time often had specific themes to them. And one very good example of this theme would be Atlantia Fugens. Uh, this is a beautiful illuminated work, which is based on the story of the, the huntress running away at Atlantia. And there's a play on words, uh, Fugens running, but there's also a fugue. You've, you've got a a multimedia meditation experience here whereby there's actually a piece of music that you can play along with a symbol or emblem to meditate upon and a text to memorize. This is a real alchemical adventure and a, a wonderful text to own and a journey to go on. Later on, we can also see more diagrammatic works. Here we are, the, the book of the secret symbols of the Rosicrucians. This is really a text about connecting with the underlying energies. And there is a complete path of genuine attainment in this. Uh, if uh, you were to pursue this with dedication and with the correct teacher, you would achieve your hermetic adepthood or Rosicrucian enlightenment uh, page by page. And just look at the, the, the detail here. The systematic nature of these different texts is consistent. And this is because there is a, a, an underlying structure which is well thought out and explained. The whole idea is that you are going to go through a series of experiences and transformations. You're going to begin with ones which are 
purifying. And then move to ones which empower your existing abilities. And then finally, you're going to be able to approach higher powers and energies as you ascend using your consciousness. There are many different ways of symbolising this. Uh, the term that was used at the time was the golden chain. The golden chain is uh, the link between you and higher consciousness. It comes from a, a quote from the Iliad where it says that Zeus throws down a chain and he could pull anyone up on it or anyone could climb up, but no one could pull him down. So this was taken as an alchemical code. You can ascend uh, in your states of mind and literally you can ascend to higher levels of attainment. So the underlying structure is normally one that uses the elements. You're going to master earth to learn to be very stable and solid and fully integrated. You're going to master water, be very intuitive and flexible. And then you'll work on mastering air to be a bit very intellectual and uh logical and full of understanding and then you're going to be able to master fire be ambitious and energetic and connecting you can see if you mustered all these four you'd be a very balanced uh, very healthy individual and that's when you've got through your kind of stages you've purified yourself through these four you've empowered these um, four in yourself you've got great awareness then you're going to move up you're going to go through the the planets and each planet's got a different lesson and for you to aspire to but there are other systems some are based on the kabbalah some on the, the scales of existence going through uh, for all the way from a rock through a plant to an animal you know going up through uh, nature uh, some of them are based on the the zodiac or the deacons or the mansions of the moon uh, often there were tales uh, the trials of hercules or uh, a christian story something which would have the same different uh, steps but would be in a exciting, memorable and inspirational way. So now we've covered all aspects of this emblematic tradition and the use of these emblems as a means to lead to revelation. Let's just recap the practice and go into a little bit more detail. So if you were a modern practitioner and you wanted to use this Renaissance path, what would you do? Well, first of all, you might need to do a little bit of adjustment to your view of it. People in those times really believed. So they were fully aware of the transformative power of symbols. They'd seen people use them around them. They were really connected uh, with this. So they would be approaching the emblem book, uh, the set of symbols with the, an attitude of reverence and dedication kind of the same way we would if we were taught something uh, in a sacred place. If we were in a cave in a mountain and a, a monk showed us a set of secret techniques, they'd have that kind of positive attitude and trust in it. So the first step is to believe. The second would be to learn. The practitioners in those days would have a lot more background than we uh, have now. So we'd have to learn the story and explore the quotes and really tune into that tradition so we've got the kind of scheme of things behind for our contemplations. Then we would memorise. So learning would help us do this. Remember that the belief was that if you put symbols in the right order into our deep mind, into our subconscious, this would have a powerful effect in itself. So if you were going to memorise a whole set of symbols about ascending to higher places or transforming your heart or improving on all levels, this would be seen as an amazingly powerful thing. It would be like the whole of your being would listen to what you were saying and start that upgrade to your consciousness. So we need these memory images in place before we move to the next step to contemplate. You'd really spend your time exploring, puzzling on, solving the mystery of each one of those emblems in turn. 
you'd know, just know that they've got a message for you and that that message is going to lead to a big change. You're looking for that aha moment. To begin with, you would probably use the hints and explanations that were in the text. But pretty soon, once the memory images were in place and you'd started the exploration, inspiration would hit and you would take on a different feel and expression within. So you would explore your own interpretations. The practitioner would just let go of uh, what was given to them. Those those phrases, those uh, different poems, they're the starting pistol, not the racetrack. It might be for you, it's about uh, a astrological or alchemical or uh, personal transformation. It might be something you see in nature. When your own meaning appears, hold on to it and follow it. Once you've got that in place, once you see the picture, then it's about sympathy. So if the card's giving you a lesson of love, then you need to cultivate love for the right things. If it's giving you a message of truth, then you need to be at one with truth. Now, this would be done not just through meditation on the card or this concept. It would be done in life. You would only speak the truth if you were seeking truth in your meditation. You would show love in life. The outer expression of the inner contemplation must match. And finally, you know when you reach success on a card because contraction would happen. You would achieve oneness. So once you only spoke the truth, when you meditated on the truth and you only looked for the truth, so there was no covering things up, then you would achieve a oneness with truth. These lessons would almost always lead to an empowerment that naturally flowed onto the next card or the next image, depending on how you had your emblems uh, with you. So that concludes uh, this exploration of the emblematic tradition. We've covered everything in turn and I hope will give enough of an insight that you yourself could find some emblems which will take you on your own journey. If you're interested to see a modern expression of this tradition, then you might want to have a look at the death of Hades, which is my own set of emblem cards, you can explore uh, by clicking on the link in the description box below. My name is Martin Folks, and I hope that this video was of interest to anyone wanting to learn the lessons from symbolic pictures or paintings in order to advance and evolve their consciousness. Until next time, let's make every word, thought and action count.